if we run this conference with one tenth of the integrity of Jim Freeze, we'll be doing okay. So now I don't have to worry about telling Jim, um, hey, I've changed the name of this talk right before the talk. Uh, it's actually going to be called the river. And it's with mixed emotions that I give this talk because I love talking about things like technology and language adopt, adoption. What I'd like to talk about today is culture. But instead of doing it in a finger pointing, wagging kind of way, um, what I'd like to do is tell a little bit of my story and about how, and to kind of weave a metaphor and then talk about how that uh, metaphor weaves through elixir. So I was born in, well, I was born in Pennsylvania, but then a month later, <laughs> I moved to Memphis, Tennessee, a town on a river. And we spent a lot of our, our uh, summer evenings going to events like Memphis in May, and we heard Old Man River, kind of on the banks of the river. We saw the rusted fixtures, the cleats where they would haul in the barges, and I have had rivers in my blood. I've done some fun things on rivers. I've done some stupid things on rivers too. You know, this particular rapid is called bull sluice. And a sluice means something that lets uh, smaller things through, but not bigger things through. Like maybe the nose of your kayak, but not the rest of your body. So after I'd gone over this rapid, uh, three people ran up and gave me a hug. And I said, yeah, that was a great run, right? They said. No, you don't understand. You just went right over the top of Decapitation Rock. And I said, that's a thing? <laughs> right. That's not the dumbest thing I've done in a kayak. Can you guys read that? Or is it too dark? You guys in the front, what does it say? Seven people have drowned, people drowned here. Yeah, so that would be the dumbest thing I've done in a kayak. Uh, not drowned there, but, you know, actually run down. <laughs> after, after driving all night and having no sleep um, was a great time. But um, as I kayaked, being a kayaker from Texas, from Austin, Texas, I didn't get a lot of chances to um, do the things that I loved um, without driving a lot of hours. And I kept winding my way through this little town called Chattanooga <laughs> and spending some time on that pedestrian bridge which is at the time, and I guess it's still one of the longest ones in, in the world, it just kind of got into my blood like the river, right? And eventually, you know, I, I had kids, the kids graduated, and then we immediately jumped in the car, and we did it. We moved to Chattanooga. Now, that was before I had talked to Osa and War and seen this cannon, which is pointing right about directly at my house. Language is war, yeah, I don't know. I, don't let any Java guys up there, right? <laughs> um, but one of the cool things about being in Chattanooga was seeing all of this old infrastructure. I don't know about you, but I like the electronic things and I like old industrial things too. And kind of imagine what they were and what they did. But some of the bits of infrastructure have been reclaimed, right? Like this old steel dock this, this pier, and some of them are still in use. All up and down the river, you can see these barge tie-ups. And sometimes they look like this, and sometimes they're multi-purpose. You know, there's an osprey nest up there, and they're kind of a bird that's a lot like eagles, and you can kind of see them diving on the fish. It is a surreal experience. But one of the things that happened when I moved to Chattanooga is that we went from being a two-car family to a one-car family. And Maggie's not going to ride or take a bike, <laughs> so I became the one that walked in and took bikes around. And so I had a lot of time to think about the river and about questions like, where did this river come from? And what made this town grow? And, you know, with all the rusted out infrastructure and, and kind of broken things, what nearly killed this town? And ultimately, where is this river going? And it's a philosophical question. 
and I like philosophical questions, and I like metaphors. So that's the theme of our talk. So we'll be jumping back and forth between <coughs> the river in Chattanooga. This is the Tennessee River. It could be any river. In the language, and where we've come from, and where we're going, and what's happening on the river. Okay, so let's talk about where the river came from. And of course, I'm going to throw a metaphor at you. And you know what the metaphor is. It's going to be a spring, right? And I want you to start to think back to the spring when Elixir was first born. I can remember pretty well. We were at, it would be this table right here. When Jose, yeah, Jim, it's your conference. Um, and we were all sitting around that, that table right there. With Chris there, Jose, um, myself, I think Dave Thomas was there too. And we were leaning in saying, yeah, maybe we hit critical mass. Did we hit critical mass? Um, we were going to put 100 people in a programming conference. Right? And Jose gave this wonderful talk. And, and in the talk, he put up this, this chart, like ripples on a river. There are the commits. And you could see all this, this big wall of just furious enthusiasm right out of the gate, right? And then you could see things kind of slow down and spike and then almost stop, right? And Jose called that the Valley of Despair, right? Where he was trying, I think it was a prototype language-oriented approach, and it didn't really kind of click, and it didn't gel with what was happening in the rest of the ecosystem. But then he embraced Erlang, and he broke through. And you could see the energy that, that has never stopped since then. So maybe that's our spring. Maybe you could find a different spring. But the point is that at, at some point in the beginning, there was this joy and enthusiasm, and we got to add to it and build to it. And you know, for me, the things that added to the spring or, and turn it into a spring were these moments. Like one of the things that we did is um, we liked to go get Indian food. And it became a meme for us that when, when we were all out together, we would go get Indian food. And I think the reason was there was one particular moment where Jose was building a web server. Do you guys remember what the old web server was called? Dynamo, Dynamo that's right. Who said that? All right, a couple of you. Yeah. So. Um, that wasn't a pretty, a pretty project, right? Um, I've written worse code, but this wasn't great code. And it was pretty clear that it's a, it's a hard thing, maybe an impossible thing, to write a language and champion a language and also write a web server. So um, I had convinced my boss that we needed to use Elixir. And he said, what database integration are you going to use? And I said, I don't know. And he said, what web server are you going to use? I said, I don't know but we're going to get somebody to write one. He said, we can't write a web server. I said, trust me, right? And so um, Jose and I talked about this a little bit, and mostly it was Jose talking and me saying, yeah, that's a good idea, do it, right? But he talked about this idea of building this, rather than building a web server, he said, why don't we build this kit for building web servers? And it was called Plug, right? And then, so we were at a conference in San Francisco, and um, you know, three months after writing this, uh, we had a conversation with Chris McCord, and there was, there was kind of the, the new tentative relationship thing, but it was really exciting, and then we decided to go get some Indian food. And since then, you know, that moment has kind of um, you know, rolled into the river. And conferences like this one, so, so Jim mentioned that, um, that Elixir Conf grew out of this, but actually all the Elixir conferences grew out of this one. And you know, a lot of us, how many have been to more than two Elixir conferences? How many have been more than more more than three? More than four. So you've seen this happen, right? You've seen this river kind of start as a stream and you've seen it grow. And you've seen it uh, kind of kind of raise the level, right? And there were, there were all kinds of moments, too many to mention, throughout these conferences. One of them was, that was really cool was when, when Chris got up, got up and he told this story about 
putting two million connections in one chat room, right? And, um, and then he said, well, that wasn't enough. So we sent, so Jose sent a whole Wikipedia page. And almost all, all the um, clients got that whole Wikipedia page within four seconds. And we were all kind of um, grinning ear, ear to ear. But you get the sense that for a river, you need a watershed. And it's not any one moment. It's multiple moments. And when you have enough contributing into this watershed, then you get a river. So what's interesting is this is the Tennessee River just upstream of where Maggie and I live right now. And you see almost all the floodgates are open. And the river that was 18 feet below our new house is now within you know, five feet of our new house. So um, that's it's kind of with mixed emotions that we watched this one, but you know, TVA has got this. Um, but when you see these open floodgates, you really think about the watershed and say, where is all that water coming from? And when, when, when you have a river like the Tennessee River, sometimes you're not worried about, um, about having enough water, but when you're starting a language, you start to think about what the watershed is. What, what, what are the people? What are the companies? What are the ideas that are going to make this, this thing, this stream, grow into a river? And so one of the first questions that you have to ask is, where are the people going to come from? So if you've ever read a technical book called Crossing the Chasm, it's by a guy, um, uh, Jeffrey, oh, what's his last name? I don't remember. Uh, Jeffrey? Uh, I can't hear it from back here, but um, so Crossing the Chasm, excellent technical book. His basic premise was that when you do technical marketing, you, marketing, you can't start with everyone. You have to pick a niche. And so what was ours? Well, one of them was certainly Erlang because we had this beautiful ecosystem, this beautiful technology, wonderful virtual machine. And then you could say that some of the language uh, some of the watershed for the language in terms of people certainly came from Ruby. Certainly Jose did, certainly Chris did. And many of us felt comfortable with the syntax of Elixir. If you're a maker, you could say, hey, I didn't want to write my embedded systems in C anymore. You could say, if I wanted to achieve performance, that maybe, I, maybe, um, maybe Java wasn't enough for me anymore. So you could look at a watershed in terms of people. Where do your people come from? You could look at a watershed in terms of ideas. A Verlang's OTP, or Ruby's approachable syntax, or the macros from a language like Clojure. And we don't say that word very often, right? But the macros are important for Elixir because it allows us to bootstrap the language in itself in a much more productive way. It's huge. And then, not the, the river version of streams, but the enum version of streams. These, some of these ideas uh, came from the Haskell language. I can remember being in London where, um, when a woman named Jessica and Jose were working on a concept called Iterates that was a, um, that's the theoretical underpinnings that allowed us to have a common model between the, um, the list and the streams between the two types of, of enumerables. And then, of course, there's, there's pipes, which were really, I think, probably a smaller part of Elixir until Dave wrote his book. And he actually built the pipe into the subtitle. And that, that little piece of brilliance kind of taught us in, that instead of building with objects, we could build with transformations, and we would be fine. You can also think of a watershed in terms of the marketplace. What are the things that, that a market needs for a language to succeed? So I know that a lot of you will say that Elixir uh, exploded because of concurrency, and that's certainly partially true. But I believe that a big part of Elixir is allowing us to organize code in a superior way, that we're not limited to one type of extension. And that's inheritance. Right? 
There's a concept in Elixir called a reducer. And I'm going to think of it, you know, you could think of it this way. I'm going to think of it this way. That works in almost everything except enum reduce, right? Um, and you could write your, your reducer code this way, right? Um, or you could write it, write it in terms of a pipe. And once you see it this way, you will see reducers everywhere, right? This version or this version. This is kind of exploding a reduce. And if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can see it this way, mix and match reducers. All kinds of reducers, you see them everywhere. If you had your eyes open throughout the presentations, I counted eight different reducers uh, during the talks. You know, and things like queries, Phoenix channels, Live view sockets, um, OTP, which is like a, a slow motion map reduce in action, right? But this type of organization gives us more power than we probably had access to with other languages. You could also think of the intellectual, the intellectual watershed in terms of life cycle. Of course, what I'm talking about is OTP supervision, right? When you hear supervision, I don't want you to think in terms of failover and supervision. I want you to think in terms of life cycle. Who's this guy? Yeah, yeah, the IT crowd. It's a British comedy. If you haven't watched it, if you're any, anyone in the Erlang or Elixir community, you have to watch this show. And if anybody called this guy, now, this guy is a support guy who works in the base, basement. They would always ask a support question, and he would always answer, did you try turning it off and on again, right? That's life cycle. So basically, our bet is that if you can define how to cleanly take a system down and how to cleanly start it back up again, and you can detect it, then failover is free. So with these very simple processes with this very simple methodology and thought process, we can actually build self-healing software. And there are phone switches that haven't been um, down more than a handful of times in, in you know, five years or longer. And of course, you have to, you have to talk about concurrency, about those, those two million concurrent users on a single box measured um, in Elixir. You can think of a watershed in terms of companies, right? And I really want you to think of the watershed, the things that actually helped give birth to Elixir as companies. In fact, Elixir would not exist without Platforma Tech that actually gave Jose the time to work through that difficult problem in more than one programming model and actually stuck with him um, as, as Elixir was picking up steam and actually supports him on the road. Let's give Platforma Tech a hand. I think that Bleach Report has to be seen as a watershed company. This is a company that was one of the first to actually solve Elixir problems at scale. They're the first to actually help, um, help when, when we have initiatives like diversity initiatives, uh, to sponsor uh, conferences like Maggie and I's conference in, um, in Chattanooga, and um, this conference in the past, and actually Elixir conference um, as well. They are very much a foundational company. Let's give them a hand. Oh, and what would we do without Dockyard? Dockyard, who, who's actually given Chris most of his time to play with concepts until he builds something beautiful that's going to change the world. Dockyard. We're going to do this one more time, not because there's only one more company, but because um, Latote has been right at the heart of what we do with Elixir. How many nerves talks did we see? Let's give Latote a hand. <laughs> so there are watersheds and there are rivers that grow. 
So here's the difficult part of this talk. When I was thinking about Chattanooga, one of the things that happened was there was a lot of commerce and it grew. That's exciting. But there's a point of time when springs become rivers. So let me draw a couple of different metaphors here. Maggie remembers this guy. This guy is a guy named Steve Daniel. He actually wrote a book called Texas Whitewater. And if you know anything about Texas Whitewater, there's not much unless it's flooding, right? Uh, so it actually became possible to be a kayaker in Texas when US Geological Services put gauges on the rivers, and you could see when the river was on the way up, and you didn't want to be on it then, you know, because there were things like barbed wire kind of cutting across. Um, but after the ri rivers had risen high enough and swept all this like lumber and junk down the river, all the barbed wire was cleaned out, and then you could jump on them, right? And every now and then, not too often, I was kind of a, a, like a C-list celebrity, like a C-list kayaker for Steve Daniel. But every now and then, when, when he'd work down the list far enough to, to find somebody, he would get to me, and we would just pack up the car and go and jump on a river. And I didn't know it at the time, but I know it now. There's a magic number in Steve's head. It was 30 feet, right? This is a little scary, so don't try this at home. 30 feet is the border between some, where, where something is not legally navigable and you'll get arrested, and when it's legally navigable and you won't get arrested. And the landowners often get to set the rules. And Steve was interested in challenging the precedents so that other people could run down the rivers. When streams become rivers, the rules change. When springs become rivers, like you could have a, a, a jet ski on a creek, on a stream, on a lake, it doesn't matter. When you're on a river, you see this little decal, you have to register it. You have to behave in certain ways. When streams become rivers, things change. So in Chattanooga, this thing is a working river, and actually that's a working drawbridge that the tug is coming under. Um, they don't open it all the time. They only open it often enough to make sure that it's in working condition. But it's tempting to think that you can move heavy loads on that river for almost free. This is one of the biggest cranes in Chattanooga. It's just a, a less than a mile walk um, down from our house. Uh, this was a, um, this is a company called Alstom that, that built turbines for nuclear reactors for a little while. But it's not free. There are tremendous infrastructure responsibilities for the people who maintain the rivers. In fact, this is a project that's turning this lock where you basically go from one lake to another lake on the Tennessee River into something that's much longer so that if I'm moving a lot of freight down the river, like say I have nine barges that I'm push, pushing with one tugboat, it would take me 10 hours, one hour for the tugboat and one for each of the barges to get through. And after this infrastructure is done, it's gonna take much longer, right? The people who drive the tugboats, the people who own the tugboats, the people who move the cargo understand very well the infrastructure that goes into the river. It's not free. Which brings me to my next topic, what nearly killed this river town, right? So when I walk next to all this rusted infrastructure, what happened? So one of the things that can go wrong on a river is a flood. And you th can think of the flood, there's a lot of water. You could think of a flood as something that normally wouldn't happen if the watershed is small enough or if, there's, if a language is not successful and the pull requests aren't coming fast enough from enough of us. So one of my heroes on the planet is Matt's. 
This doesn't sound much like maths. Ruby has a motto called Menswan. Mats is nice, so we are nice. This was a tweet from Mats, not four months ago. This is a statement from the creator of Python, maybe the most important object-oriented language in the world due to its role in data sciences, who has stepped down as the benevolent dictator for life. So I wasn't thinking a lot about these things until um, Stu Holloway, a good friend, he's, he's probably the voice of closure now. Uh, he gave a talk about practical stewardship. And one of the things that he talked about is conversations about conversations. This is Walter Cronkite, uh, apologize for the picture, it's the best one I could find. In 1971, he came on um, onto everybody's TV, 6.15 at night, and said, Chattanooga is the most polluted city in the country. There's good news here. Because after conversations about conversations, about changing the behavior, about changing whole mental paradigms, things changed. So I believe that we have to have, that we need to head this off before there's a whisper about it in our community. I believe that we have to have conversations about conversations. I, have to, I believe that we need to talk about when to advocate. You should build something. The answer is never. How we treat each other the language that we use. I think that we need common rules to point to when there's a difficult conversation, we could say, hey, time out. This is, what, this is what we believe. This is how we treat each other. This is who we are. I really don't want to, I don't want to be a person to kind of point to a code of conduct. Um, I don't want to be a person to say, we need more rules, but I do want us to be able to treat each other better. I don't know how to do this. If you've got some ideas, I'd love to hear them. I want to start a conversation about conversations. But that's not all that this talk is about. One of the coolest things about this conference is seeing the look on Chris McCord's face when he shows you guys something cool and you guys applaud. When Chris McCord says, these things that Jose gave us were powerful and meaningful to me, and you guys applaud. When you, when you see something that moves you, that actually improves your life, express your appreciation. It goes a long way. We need many interactions, um, five, ten, or more positive interactions for every negative one. And when things were out of balance, bad things happen to the community. When things are in balance, great things happen in the community and you can do anything. So I want to talk a little bit about where the river is going or where we're going to take it. Right? So let's come back to this idea of there's a watershed for ideas. Right? The collective innovations that are coming into Elixir that are making it special. So I believe that this is everybody's fear that the river will change and leave people behind, right? So I think maybe the most powerful innovation that we've seen in Elixir this year is this one. Elixir is done, right? This allows us to push the line of innovation from the middle of Elixir to the top, and the invitation, the beautiful invitation that Jose gave people to build on top becomes more powerful because he's put his money where his mouth is. He said, I've done my part. It's time for you to do your part. That's excellent, right? He's also saying something that I don't want you to miss. I trust you to take this somewhere special. 
So in this triad of ideas, of important ideas about Elixir, we could talk a lot about concurrency or life cycle, but I think that we've seen a whole bunch of talks already about it. I want to talk about the idea of organization. So I think that one of the best things that's happening in, in, in um, Elixir today, maybe one of the best things that's happening in commercial web development is LiveView. It's really exciting. So um, we have these, these concepts that, that you have to keep in your head. And most of these you can basically manage from one place, and one of these that you can't. And it keeps growing, right? So JavaScript is not evil. People that write JavaScript are not evil. But when you can fit all of the cons all important concepts in one place in your head, more things become possible with less time. This is the kind of idea where we're basically trading one advantage that's less important for another advantage that's perhaps more important in certain use cases. That's groundbreaking stuff. That's groundbreaking stuff. And the thing about it is we are seeing this type of pattern happen throughout the Elixir community, in nerves, in scenic. Right? But the last bit of organization that I want to talk about is you. This is the canvas of ideas, of organizations, that's, that's really going to drive us to the next, to the next, um, next place. So I'm winding down here, but I want to make one more point. I want you to vote. And I want your vote to look like this. No, not like that. I want your vote to look like this. Right? This is as far as I'm going to stretch this metaphor. This is a place called Ross's Landing. It's kind of the heart of where Chattanooga's revitalization came from. They built this, this beautiful place um, from, from where the steamboats used to drop troops, um, you know, supplies, um, and where that, that turned into a commercial center. Uh, they turned it into a place called Ross's Landing. And one of the things that they did is there's a, um, there's a monument called the Trail of Passage that was based on the Trail of Tears. So you can vote with your behavior. Ross's Landing was also a place of great commerce. And we've seen in this talk, and you guys already know how much, how much um, important companies have given to Elixir, but you can vote for them with your dollars. Ross's Landing is also a place where there's a great festival. You can see the boats in the background. You can see the fireworks. You can see the 60-foot tall stage. You know, and that's not the, the top piece of the bubble. And people come from all over the country to kind of feel this atmosphere. But you can vote with your companionship and help build that feeling for us. The Tennessee Park Beautification Project uh, has, has led to more parks on the river. And we actually live on this, this river walk. It's 11 miles long, and it's pristine. And it's not all managed by the government. So you can vote with your time. So in closing, be kind and find your joy. And I'll see you soon on the river. Thank you.